I'm Dustin Goes to Hollywood. I am Mally Moore. And this is the Silver Linings Playlist, a podcast that tries to find the silver lining in some of cinema's bleakest endings. Is it? See, Mally, that's how you do it. Okay, no, no, don't. <laughs> Shut up. Thank you for listening, everyone. Uh, if this is your first time uh, listening to our program, what we do is uh, we build a playlist of movies that end with the the viewer not feeling too great. Uh, they can be weird endings. They can be sad endings. They can just be straight up fucked up endings. Uh, as this show has proved, we've covered all of them, and uh, this is a this is a pretty classic fucked up ending. I, I would say it's probably up there with the uh, past episode, The Mist or Requiem for a Dream. I would say. Oh yeah, oh yeah. It's a it's a rough one. It's surprising it took us this long to get to this episode, but uh, yeah, fin- Fincher Fincher just keeps giving us these movies. Mm-hmm. This uh, is is this our second Fincher film? I think. T- yes. Yes. Yeah. Gone Girl and this. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, reoccurring <laughs> thing. Like we, there's just some directors we just we caught con- we constantly see on the show. Um, so yeah, as you can tell by the title, today we're talking about David Fincher's seminal movie Seven. Uh, Mally, what was your relationship like with this movie? When was the first time you saw it? Um, shockingly, not in theaters. Yep, same. Um, because I was six when this movie came out, and yeah. I don't think I would have been allowed to. Yeah. I did, however, see it when it... I can't remember. I, I saw this before Fight Club. I know that. Because mm. I remember when Fight Club came out, like, I remember seeing trailers for that and be like, oh, it's a movie about making soap. And yeah. then I saw it, I think my brother, older brother, rented it and we watched it. Mm-hmm. Um... And I was like, oh, this is awesome. And he then, I think, rented this movie after seeing Fight Club. Yeah. Um, back in the old Blockbuster days. Because that was mm. our thing. You know, every Saturday, baby, we go on a Blockbuster, yep. we get in a movie. Yep. Um, but yeah, so I think f- I think Fight Club was my first Fincher film I knowingly saw. And then based off of that, my brother rented this. And that's how I saw it. And this movie fucked me up. Yeah, I definitely... Again, I, I have a long history of watching movies at an age that I was not way too young yeah. for a lot of movies. Yeah, yeah. I saw... Like, I saw... For, I, the first one I saw from Dust Till Dawn, again, another blockbuster rental. Yeah. I was watching it with my brother and my mother. I was like 10. I saw the original Dawn of the Dead in when I was like 8, so it would have been 1998, I think. And that was uh, that one fucked me up. It's now it's one of my favorite movies, but man. Oh, absolutely. I think that really I think me and you both seeing these kinds of movies so young really mm-hmm. shaped who we are now. Yeah, around like 6 And explains a lot about our personalities. <laughs> <laughs> around like around like 16 when like dial up was phasing out and people had cable modems where they can, you know, yeah. log on. That's when I really started to get into my you know, watching movie addiction where I would just find anything I can get my hands on and watch it. So seven was definitely amongst those. I don't know if I saw it before Fight Club. I I want to say I probably saw it after. Um, yeah, because let's get this movie came out in 1995. Mm-hmm. That is insane to me. It does not look like a 95 film. No, it's fairly modern for what it, for its looks. I mean, it looks like like at least ten years in the other, making. Yeah, like if you compare it to other films like around that time, like I don't know, it just doesn't. It's not a mid 90s movie yeah it, it like, stands out that this movie could come out now yeah like it's insane uh so yeah as you mentioned uh the year's 1995 director david fincher uh the movie starts brad pitt morgan freeman gwyneth paltrow and richard roundtree uh and people that regularly listen to the show know that when i pull the name of the leads or the characters that appear in the movie, I pull from Roger Ebert's personal reviews or from his website yep. if they're newer movies. So that's why that one titular character is not... Uh, well, not titular, but that one pivotal character is not listed here. Uh, he, but, I mean, he wasn't credited at all. Yeah. And I'm going to get into that too. Budget, $33 million, made $327 oh, also, million. I do have to, I do want to point out, I know Roger Ebert didn't listen, but R. Lee Ermey is in this movie. Yeah. <laughs> which is awesome. Uh, and police captain. right now, 80% fresh on Rotten Tomatoes. Certified. Okay. Okay. Fair enough for me. 
Yeah, uh, I'll give it that. Man, I don't have a lot to say up front. Not a film for everyone. No, I don't have a lot to say up front. So you want to just jump into the trailer? Yeah. All right, let's listen. Do you like what you do for a living? These things you see? You have to wear blinders sometimes. Most times. Detective William Somerset is looking for a way out. You're retiring. Six more days and you're all the way gone. So how long have you lived here? Too long. Detective David Mills is looking for a way in. We'll be spending every waking hour together from now until the time I leave. I'll show you who your friends and enemies are. Look, I've worked homicide five years. Not here. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we have ourselves a homicide. They're caught in a game. No fingerprints and no witnesses of any kind. Nope. About the only thing we know about that guy right now is he's totally insane. Where the price of sin is death. There are seven deadly sins. Gluttony. You want to come take a look at this? Greed. No one touches anything. Sloth, wrath, pride, lust, and envy. Seven. You can expect five more of these. Body was found on Tuesday morning. I hate this city. We're gonna get who did this. This will be the very definition of swift justice. There are two more bodies, two more victims. This guy is methodical, exacting, and worst of all, patient. He's laughing at us. <laughs> he had a gun. He's two murders away from completing his masterpiece. Ah! Let's finish it. Brad Pitt, Morgan Freeman, Gwyneth Paltrow. Have you ever seen anything like this? No. Seven. Dude, I love, like, the old movie trailer voice guy <laughs> well it's funny this you mentioned trailer that. is so 95 yeah it's funny you mentioned that i was gonna say i feel like this trailer is better it's it's so close to being a modern trailer if they just removed that voiceover like it yeah. could it could easily fit in with a trailer you'd see today and that's why i really enjoy it but yeah that that vo really takes me out of it um, yeah if you take that vo out like it's a damn good trailer it's not terribly long yeah um doesn't give you much to go on it's the basis per, basic like basic premise like there's a seven deadly sins killer these two guys are trying to stop him yeah uh and that's really all you get from the trailer and of course keeping kevin spacey out of uh you know out of the limelight and keeping him in the dark is a great idea marketing wise because it really helps when you and get into the had, movie like, he personally insisted on that yeah and it really the sells it. Producers and like the like the production company wouldn't, you know, they wanted to list him like it's fucking Kevin Spacey. Yeah, let's uh let's get into the film proper. I wanted to start off real quick addressing like the big the big uh current issue is the uh current event of Kevin Spacey. Um, yeah, you know, we originally on our slates we were going to be doing uh American Beauty this season. Uh, yeah. spoiler alert it's going to be pushed back because we've got some other ideas in mind yeah. um but i think this is a perfect opportunity for us to discuss something that i am quite passionate about um the obvious question is what what do we think about kevin spacey or actors in his current predicament like i'm able to separate the artist from the individual to separate the character from the actor uh i know a lot of people have an issue with that and think that you know people like him should be scrubbed from history but i feel like it it does a disservice to the filmmakers the writers the all the hard work that goes into this movie that you have one bad apple that you just scrub you know yeah like movie. i i understand him not really getting much work going forward like that's completely understandable yeah um i am totally fine if kevin spacey never acts again i'm okay with right. that i think exactly retroactively going back and saying 
you know, oh, we can't watch this movie now. Like, I kind of feel the same See, way about uh, about Louis C.K. Like, I love his TV yeah. show. I think he was a great writer, a great director, and a great actor. Piece of shit, kind of human, but... Uh, oh, completely. And not saying he should be lumped in with the Kevin Spaceys or the Harvey Weinsteins, but, you know, it's... Yeah, no, I completely agree. Like, um, like going forward, if I never see Kevin Spacey in a movie again, rock on. Yeah. Um, I don't think it should stop people from, um, seeing, you know, rewatching, you know, this movie or, you know, any of his other past work. Like, yeah. I think there's, I, again, I'm kind of with you. I can separate, you know, the character from the actor. Yeah. I think there's this idea That's that the whole, that, I mean, that is the whole point of acting to begin with. Yeah. Is when you watch a performance, I should like, if I'm watching this movie, I shouldn't be like, I shouldn't be seeing um, Kevin Spacey, Brad Pitt, and Morgan Freeman, yeah. and Kevin Spacey. I should be seeing Mill, Somerset, and John Doe. Exactly. Like that's the whole point of being a good actor is that when people watch your performance, they don't see you; they see someone else. Yeah, I mean that's why actors like Gary Oldman and uh, Daniel Day Lewis are so prolific in that they just dis- disappear into their characters i think kevin spacey was right on the cusp of doing stuff like that because he's st- oh I, gr- he, I agree he doesn't show up to the third act and he fucking steals the show which is uh, no 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 he shows up a little bit before well, that. He, he shows up proper in the third act uh that's right and steals the scene you know steals the whole momentum of the movie away from brad pitt oh, and morgan completely. freeman that's impressive to do against those two i mean brad pitt was fairly new at the time but still this powerhouse fucking duo right there um yeah i just wanted to address that because i'm sure people were going to wonder listening to this episode you know if we were going to talk about it so i want to do it up front and get it out the way uh of course no there is no shame in or harm in enjoying an actor's you know past work i mean morgan freeman's in the news now for allegedly doing something kind of similar in in those regards so it's yeah it's true you know, and Which, I, that one, that one was heartbreaking. Yeah. If you dig deep enough, anybody you come across is going to be like that. So, you know, it might not be on that level, but you can always find something on somebody. So I think it's very important to distinct, distinguish the two, the actor and the, the movie. Uh, now that we've bummed everyone out, let's talk about a bummer of a movie. Uh, <laughs> something I don't remember about this movie is that it starts off very quietly. There's yeah. there's no score, there's no title sequence, there's no fanfare at all, and we don't. I don't think we even hear any sort of music until we get to the title sequence, if I'm not mistaken. It's uh yeah, with that nine inch nails redo of a uh, closer. Yeah, it's it's it's. Which, a, how good is the title sequence in this? Oh no, yeah, that's my second note. Is that like, it's impressive? Shout out David David Fincher's films always have the dopest. Yeah, opening credits. It's impressive. Like, this one is insane. Um, the one for Social Network when it's just him walking through Harvard is great. The girl with the dragon tattoo one was phenomenal. Yeah. Um, that one really stayed with me. So did this one. Like I like they like, um, you know, me and you both went to film school. Yeah. Um, they show the opening credits for this movie. Yeah. Like and go in into- a, in one of our classes, I think, as I think it's like an editing thing. Yeah, they go into detail about how they did it and everything, about how everything was handmade. Like they could yeah, have and like the, copied. the names, like the credits were actually scratched into the physical film. Yeah. Which is nuts. This uh plus I love nine inch nails. Yeah, this this seven was your your pick uh for for the film we covered this week. Uh yeah. I gotta say, watching it this time, uh I I put the director's commentary on. Cause it, Ooh, it featured. I, I have been meaning to do that because mm-hmm. I have. I just got actually a buddy of mine was moving and getting rid of all his Blu-rays because he's all digital now. That's me. <laughs> he's one of those. Yep. Um, I'm I'm old school, dude. I love me a physical copy. Hmm. Um, like all my friends have like Kindles and are reading books on there. And I'm like, no, nah, I'm gonna go buy the physical book. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I just so he just gave me like this new like special edition Blu-ray that I've been working my way through. Um, which is why I wanted to watch this one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, for this week, and yeah, it's rad. Bunch of special features. Highly recommend, guys. Pick it up. It's got um, a. It's got Fincher. It's got Brad Pitt. Uh, Brad Pitt and Morgan Freeman on there. Um, nice. I'm pretty sure Morgan Freeman was recorded separately. 
because I don't think he interacts at all with Brad Pitt or, or David Fincher and Morgan Freeman. Like, so, so he wasn't like, it wasn't like a situation like we do where we're on different coasts talking to each other. I think like, he it was, was completely, completely I think he was completely separate because the whole time he's talking, he's, weird. he's not really addressing in film stuff that we're seeing. He's, it's kind of weird. He's just dishing out like weird filmmaking proverbs. Like he's like, as an actor, blah, 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 blah. And it's, just, <laughs> it's so distracting. Whereas like Fincher and, uh, and Brad Pitt are like, for example, during the the slot, the not the sloth, the uh, the gluttony crime scene, they're talking about how the sound stage yeah, was built. Which is our first our first crime scene. Yeah, yeah. They talk about how the sound stage was built and how they had like actual cockroaches on set, and to prevent them from oh, disappearing, different to get them from disappearing into the set, they'd put Vaseline in like every crack and crevice so they couldn't escape. Really? It, it's uh, yeah. So you got like interesting tidbits, and then like Morgan Freeman spouting off about this weird, like <laughs> meta physical i don't know it was kind of i interesting. feel like that's just how morgan freeman talks though probably probably um so yeah uh I, so, something that I, so most of my notes come from uh fincher's kind of commentary based on the movie like i i think where everyone who knows this movie kind of knows what it's about so i don't i think the plot in terms of the john doe story is kind of the least interesting part of this movie to me i think yeah and on this rewatch i I think the only parts of the movie that really hold up for me are those nuanced, quieter scenes, like the scene, the dinner scene between the Brad Pitt, Morgan Freeman, and Gwyneth Paltrow, or like the scenes, fantastic scenes. Yeah, boy. like all all the scenes involving like the crime scenes and everything are kind of the least interesting parts to me, which is odd for such a movie like this. But I th- I think it might have to do with what I like to call the Fight Club effect, where I think this movie might suffer from it too, and I want to hear what you think about this. But I think, for example, when was the last time you you rewatched Fight Club? Um, oh god, it's probably been a year or two, honestly. Okay, so it's still somewhat fresh. Relatively, yeah. I I think I I, I went through a whole Fincher rewatch. Yeah, but uh, not too. Probably a year or two ago. Okay. Um. So yeah. I think. Well, like, actually, it was right. It was. I think it was right before we did our Gone Girl episode. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah. Um. Th- uh, the reason I call it the Fight Club effect is because rewatching Fight Club now, I feel like that movie doesn't hold up as well. I think because you know the twist. Well, not even that. I just feel like it's so front loaded and so heady, but it's not. It's it's not really saying much of anything. It's I mean, do you think it's because it's just so ingrained in like the pop culture like I, I've mind now? I think it's nostalgia overriding quality. That's kind really? of that's kinda of okay. how I define Fight Club. I think in the moment movies like that look like they're cultural milestones and they look like they're impressive. It's kinda of like and and this is gonna sound weird, but at the time when that band first came out, no one really had a problem with Nickelback. But now, you know, fifteen, twenty years later, every it's it's the punching back. But I, and I think it's because people are realizing, oh, the nostalgia of that time is now finally uh, underselled by the quality of the music. Like it's things like that. Like there's there's movies that are out there that just people think are amazing, and then when they rewatch them, they do not hold up. Uh, I so yeah, I I don't know if I, on this rewatch, like I said, I just didn't find myself as in inundated in the the quality of the movie as much as like interesting. Maybe it's just me. I I don't know. I like I said, I, there's a bunch of movies like that. That most of them are late nineties, early two thousands. There's movies that just so don't I, hold up for me. You you mentioned writing, uh, specifically the writing on Fight Club. Mm-hmm. Um, something I think is kind of funny, both the writer for this, um, Andrew Walker, or Andrew Kevin Walker, mm-hmm. and um, the writer from Fight Club, actually more so the writer from Fight Club, haven't done a lot after their respect, respective Fincher films. Yeah. Uh, like, the guy who did Fight Club really hasn't done another notable thing. He's done a bunch of shorts. Yeah. Um, and... Andrew Walker, like his only big movie since this was Sleepy Hollow with Johnny Depp, mm. uh, Eight Millimeter, um, which is actually pretty rad, um, and uh, what is it that 
shitty Wolfman remake. Oh, uh, with uh, Benicio Del Toro? Yeah, like, I don't know, I think that's kind of funny that neither of them have really done uh, anything, like, you know, no one's still talking about, you know, Sleepy Hollow. Yeah. You'd right be now. surprised. Like, not, not, like they're, not like they're talking about Fight Club and Seven, though. Yeah, I feel like you'd be surprised at the amount of, like, when it comes to writers, like, impressive movies, like, big movies that come out that people adore, like, that they have a hard time getting oh yeah second it's, work it, like it's crazy the like the amount of like writers in hollywood who suffer from that yeah um so yeah like i said i just i find the actual crime investigation kind of like the least it's kind of like true detective for me where the characters in season one you yeah you, you be careful buddy i was gonna say the characters in season one are way more interesting to me than the actual story of uh them finding the serial killer like that's how you make good. Okay, film yeah, noir. no, that. Okay, I thought I thought you were gonna talk some shit. No, no, that, um, that's how you make good film noir. And I th- well, see, and it's funny in season two, I found the mystery more interesting than the characters. Yeah, that that's kind of because Carrie Fukunaga wasn't direct, wasn't involved. I think. Um, yeah. yeah, no, you're totally right. And I'm just gonna slide this in there. I kind of I, I ride for season two of that show. Exactly. So I, I'll defend it. I'll defend season yeah. two. Uh, it's it's great if you watch it like back to back to back. Yeah. And like if watch you the entire series in one sitting. Yeah, you're gonna. It's great if you don't in- include season. Like if you separated it from season one, it's something totally different. Um, Agreed. Anyway, this is not the True Detective. Yeah, podcast, I've, although that's a podcast I'm fucking down <laughs> for. The 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 idea of these seven deadly sins it just seems maybe it's because it's we're so far out from it, but it just seems like so like it's so placated in in media and culture. Like anything biblical yeah. like that has been done to death. And like I said, maybe it's just because I'm looking at it from, you know, almost 30 years in the future that this idea is just so, it's just been 30, done. Holy shit. Well, we're 23, right? 95, 23. Yeah. So, I mean. Hang on, dude. I, it's, man, it's Sunday. I'm not trying to do that. <laughs> it just seems kind of outdone. And I think that's, there. like I said, that's why I enjoy the quieter scenes. I think that's where Fincher really strides is, you know, they can the nuances of these characters seem much more interesting to me. Um, but then again, I do enjoy Kevin Spacey's John Doe. And when he does finally show up, his ideas, his, his philosophical ideas aren't, are, are still very interesting to hear. Uh, even if it's yeah, I agree. pretty, uh, one note, I would say. Um, so there's this idea of this movie that this movie, the, the location is never explicitly stated. And that's kind of to draw you more into the intrigue of what's happening and of the plot than to actually like try and put a location on it. So I, I think I noticed this on this rewatch, but there's no, as far as I'm concerned, there's no establishing shots of this city, are there? Uh, No, and I think that was, pr- I'm assuming that was probably on purpose. Oh, that's got to be intentional. It's just very interesting for a, yeah. a big budget movie to not have any establishing shots. And there's no real, uh, like they don't specify where it is or anything like that. Like, yeah. They just refer to you it as the really city. No, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's or like this place or there's uh or whatever. I know they filmed in downtown LA, but there's hypothesized that it's probably Seattle with how much it rains. But I, I think with that ending location scene, it is yeah safer to say Seattle have a desert. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. I think it's safer to say it's probably Southern California or somewhere around here. Um. So listen, like I said, listening to the commentary from David Fincher, I did notice. Uh, something he pointed out that everything in this movie feels claustrophobic, uh, and that's intentional, according to Fincher. Like yeah. n- normally, when you build a movie set, you build f- flyaway walls, you build a little extra space so the camera can get in there. Uh, and Fincher didn't want that; he wanted everything to scale exactly as it would be. If the camera's got to scrub up against the wall, then it's going to be up against the wall, and it's made to make you feel uncomfortable. And I, it does succeed in that. It's another reason oh, why uh, absolutely. It's another reason why the movie looks so dark and there's a whole lot of flashlights. Uh, they say they specifically use Kino flows for most things, so there's a lot of low light, but still has a nice soft glow to it. Uh, to, huh. And I, it all works, man. Like little little details like that are what separate his movies, I think, from a lot of your uh, standard filmmaking directors. Um, Agreed. And. To build off of that, there are a bunch of little details in this movie that I really do like, and it's things that I just personally wouldn't think of 
but it just shows to go it goes just goes to show you how uh dedicated fincher is to the art of directing for example the the pine tree air fresheners in the sloth crime scene i think is a fantastic idea it yeah. makes sense with i love that it makes sense with the with the character of John Doe, it covers it tries to cover up the smell of this decaying body, and it also adds a layer of, of like just a creepy factor to it. Um, but then you also have like comedic moments that are in line with the character when, uh, during their after post post dinner, Morgan Freeman asks if he could have a glass of wine, and <laughs> Brad Pitt brings him a literal glass of wine, not a wine glass, yeah. full full to the brim. <laughs> And there's, I love that. there's that little moment where Morgan Freeman just kind of looks at it like, what the fuck is this? I, I think that's great. I mean, that's how I'm drinking wine, <laughs> to be honest. Like, <laughs> I, we all have those kind of nights. Yeah. I get it. Yeah, yeah. Mally, I got a souvenir for you. I will only be, I'll only answer to the name John Doe from now on. Thank you. Well, I took a souvenir and I'm giving it to our listeners. And that souvenir is not Gwyneth Paltrow's head, Aww. but it is a... Free Blu-rays. Oh, okay. That's better. Wow. Yeah. Absolutely. It's much more interactive. True. You can actually enjoy. I don't know, dude. A head would make a great, like, puppet. All right. Well, for the least, uh, for the less macabre of our listeners, if you want to win a free Blu-ray, go over to our subreddit right now, reddit.com slash r slash silver linings playlist. Find the official discussion thread for seven this week's episode and in the comment section leave this code as a comment and we'll randomly select a winner that contest code is i took a souvenir and if you can't spell souvenir it's s-o-u-v-e-n-i-r leave that as a contest code we'll randomly pick some money and send you out some if free you stuff still spell souvenir wrong you get nothing <laughs> Yeah, you will win absolutely nothing. We will only take correctly spelled contest codes. Uh, but yeah, or we'll randomly select a person. Free Blu-rays, no strings attached, no taxes, nothing paid. You get you get it for free. That's simple. Why does Greed have two TVs that are next to each other playing the same thing? Did you notice this? Uh, because aesthetic people do cool shit. It's like literally like a sixteen-inch monitor. And there's just two standard deaf ones sitting next to each other. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't get that. Yeah, that actually <laughs> did kind of bother me, but yeah. I was like, uh, whatever. <laughs> uh, so I get it. It's it was an aesthetic choice, I guess. Matt, I, I don't want to take away from you too. I know you've got a lot of notes, and you particularly picked this movie. So honestly, don't have a lot of notes. Really, you just want to hear me Not just gonna spout? Lie. <laughs> Kinda. Yeah. I, I, I just. On, I, I don't want to ever. These are my just... favorite episodes where you just rant. Okay, I just don't ever want to just rant and rant for an hour and just go off on a, on tangents. So, oh no, feel free to stop your me. Ta- your tangents are entertaining, <laughs> at least for me. Um, I do want to ask a question. Uh huh. Where does the where do, where does seven fall on your favorite Fincher? Films? Oh, okay, that's a good question. Uh, I, I it's like. Actually, no, we've already had discussion about favorite children. You actually answered it. So <laughs> um, I'm not going to say it's like comparing children. Um, First off, what's what's t- what's number one and what's number two? Because I'm assuming this one isn't number one or sorry, not number one or two. Number one and bottom of the list. Well, I think to properly if I'm going to properly do this, I got to list out all, all of his movies. So, oh, I got him queued up. Don't work. OK, so I'm going to I'm going to write them down for my sake. I got Gone Girl. I got seven. Oh, no, no, hang on. Hang on. Okay. Hang on. Okay. I'm, I'm gonna go in order. Alien three. Oh god, that might be bottom of the barrel. Seven. Uh huh. The game. Uh huh. Fight Club. Mm hmm. Zodiac. Ooh yeah. Benjamin Button. Mm hmm. Social Network. Mm hmm. Dragon Tattoo. Mm hmm. Gone Girl. See, I think Dragon Tattoo might I be the like one. I'm, I feel like I missed one. I think he did too. I guess not. Uh, Dragon. It's probably the one I've seen the least, honestly, and I need to. Re- it's due for a rewatch. Um, oh, did I say Panic Room? No, you didn't. That's the one you forgot. Love fucking Panic Room. There you go. Okay. Love Panic Room. Yeah, I do too. Um, I gotta say, man, I feel like we did this on the Gone Girl episode. We listen. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> right now, I'm going back and forth between two. Um, I don't know if Zodiac's my favorite or if the Social Network is. 
I it's Zodiac for me. Yeah. Although Panic Room is near the top. Panic Room is really good. Uh, love Panic Room. But um, bottom honestly, of the list, so like, oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, no. Go ahead. I was gonna say bottom of the list probably unfortunately has to be Alien Three for honest. It's gonna be Alien Three and Benjamin Button's gonna be right there with it. Yeah. Yep. I just did not mess with Benjamin Button. Um. Yeah. I think seven, at least for me, is kind of right there in the middle. It's comfortably like it's, in the middle. It's, it's good, um, but I definitely think there are movies of his I like more. You know what? Without even uh, properly putting them in order, I'm just going to put it at number seven, just for the sake of the joke. Uh, All right. I respect that. That's, I, just, I respect that. Back respect in the day, that. this movie did a lot more for me. Now, nowadays, I'm just, I'm just so jaded with this kind of film that i'm just like nah it doesn't do much for me hmm okay just look okay. just look at my notes here um ah. so we mentioned uh the idea that the marketing kind of kept kevin spacey out of the credits and he's not listed in the trailer he's not on the poster um, nowhere something there was a conversation on this commentary between Brad Pitt and uh, David Fincher where they talk about the marketing for this movie. Uh, uh, David Fincher initially wanted the poster just to have like the seven scratch marks on it, no title. Yeah. Um, and of course the marketing team told him, well, you can't do that. That people need to know what the movie's called. And he's like, well, if, if they see seven marks on this poster and they can't figure out the name of the movie is seven, then what are we doing here? <laughs> um, yeah, that's true. But a more interesting note was, uh, I guess Brad Pitt had a problem with the poster. He didn't really care for it that much or something like that. And Fincher... I mean, the poster is not great. It's it's whatever. Um, But uh, David Fincher is like, you know, you know what? I ha- Someone told me this about uh, marketers and how they market movies and everything. And the way he explained it, it makes sense to me. And it kind of put it all in a perspective where I'm like, okay, I can understand that. Uh, and the way he said it was, uh, the marketing teams for movies don't look at a movie as a success he's like they never do even if it's fucking citizen kane they look at it like it's a mess like it's a travesty and their whole purpose as he put it is to save that movie and so when they look at when they look at a movie they're thinking how can i save this movie what's what can i have the audience or the potential viewer see that might entice them to see this movie um they came to an agreement about keeping kevin spacey out but It makes sense then when you look at it through that lens of why, for example, movies nowadays seem to give away so much in the trailers. Um, For example, my biggest pet peeve as of late is the Thor Ragnarok trailer. I thought it was like a a complete fail to put Thor in that trailer. I mean, not Thor. I'm sorry. Hulk. To put Hulk in the trailer. Ah, okay. I was like, it's a Thor movie. No, no, no. Don't put Thor in the trailer? Don't put Hulk in the trailer. That... It's a fun moment that the fans will get to enjoy once they see the movie. But I guess the marketers look at it as like, well, Thor movies in the past haven't done too great. So we need to put everything in this trailer to save it. And I'm like, okay, when it's put in that context, I can totally understand why they would do that. I still disagree with it. But at least it makes sense to me now where I'm like, I understand now why movies choose to go the way they do. Another example, and this one's a little more close to home, is... uh, the trailer and the international teaser for Girl on the Spider's Web dropped uh, this past week. and Yes, which is kind of ironic that we did this film. Yeah. Uh, just days after that trailer dropped. So Not on purpose, guys. The, or was it? The uh, international teaser was actually completed here at my job. And I was actually... Uh, Oh, I love it away, Lord. <laughs> kind, of, kind of offhandedly assisting the, direct, the uh, editor of that trailer and uh, helping him come up with good plot points because he wasn't familiar with the franchise. Um, but one big problem I have with that teaser is it gives away a big plot twist right in the middle of it. And it's a plot twist that's kind of not a big deal, but it's still a plot twist. And I don't think I was paying enough attention to that trailer, to be honest. Well, the trailer is not ours. I will say that trailer is not ours. And I'm for good measure, because I did not like that trailer. But the teaser is ours. And I do like the teaser. Ah, uh, so fair warning for those who go out and see it. But it's 
because you know this this new everyone googles the trailer this, now this new girl in the spider's web like if you're familiar with that franchise it's not an action-oriented franchise it's not no it's more of like a self-loathing like film noir kind of like this movie like it's a little bit yeah and but but the the trailer and the teaser are marketed as action movies and if you even go on like the current reddit thread for the trailer you'll see people even pointing that out that like oh this character is now a superhero and that's not yep. that's not who that character is and so i understand it now because like i even had i even brought the question up to him like why did they give I, to the editor i was like why did they give away that spoiler right in the middle why wouldn't they you know move it around or like conceal it better and he's like well that's what the producers want that's what test audiences are looking for like because we're we're not marketing to people that are fans of the franchise you're always marketing for the outside viewer the ones that might not be interested until they see this trailer so that's yep it explains a lot but i still disagree with the practice (laughs) Uh, i will say them keeping kevin spacey out of it definitely was a smart move on their point oh now we're back to talking about zodiac cool sorry yeah no seven (laughs) (laughs) ah shit sorry (laughs) um Sorry, I went around about way to say. So Zodiac is David Fincher's best film. Yes, because yes, yeah. Um, uh, sorry, I'm just thinking about Zodiac now. Let's um, let's seven. Yeah, yeah. Let's jump into the ending because that's what everyone knows this movie for. That's what we're here for. And I got a lot of notes on it. Uh, of course you do. Um, so yeah, let's go to the ending. So the first scene in the movie where it's not raining. Mm-hmm. That's that's exactly right. The entire higher film is overcast and rainy until mm-hmm. that um um so you want to you know walk into the setup sure uh so this whole movie brad pitt and morgan freeman are trying to find out who the serial killer is and stop him before he completes uh the seven deadly sins uh murders basically murdering people based on the seven deadly sins uh they're at the library doing some research when in walks kevin spacey covered in blood who uh Basically gives himself up, and then, uh, in an interrogate interrogation with his with the police chief, they basically say, "Look, he'll only uh, cop to everything if you go to this location, and it's only you two. Uh, Brad Pitt agrees. On the way there, Kevin Spacey's spouting off about how society's bullshit. It's the same spiel every serial killer gives off. Um, out in the desert, they uh are about to interrogate uh, John Doe, Kevin Spacey, when a FedEx truck or a delivery truck arrives. Uh, Morgan Freeman cuts off the delivery truck, think, assuming it's going to be a bomb of some sort, uh, takes the package, sends the driver out on foot. She also mentioned there's a SWAT team overhead in a helicopter just viewing everything so they can, uh, in case anything should happen, they can capture John Doe. Right, right. Uh which I did you notice who the uh, I lead did guy on I the SWAT did. team is California Doctor Cox yep. John C Scrubs. McKinley he's got a line God. he's got a line later on in this movie that I have to bring up but that just made oh, me God. go what but uh, so yeah Morgan Freeman decides he's gonna open the box he's not gonna wait for a bomb squad uh, this whole time Kevin Spacey is at gunpoint from Brad Pitt who's probably hundreds of feet away. Uh, Spouting off, uh, spouting off about his crimes and how everything's going to be complete soon. Uh, Morgan Freeman opens the box and is absolutely terrified. We never see what's in the box, but it's implied. What's in the box? Yeah, it's implied that it's uh, Gwyneth Paltrow's head, who is Brad Pitt's wife. Uh, Brad Pitt loses it again, shouts what's in the box at Morgan Freeman a bunch. Uh, a bunch. Kevin Spacey, like, re- yeah. Kevin Spacey reveals to all of our younger listeners, you'll recognize it from the meme. Yeah, Kevin Spacey reveals that his wife was pregnant, uh, and Morgan Freeman correctly points out this is exactly what he wants. the The last two Seven Deadly Sin murderers are envy and wrath. He envies your life, uh, and if you kill him, you'll be wrath, and it'll he'll win. Okay, uh, after internally. Battling with it, Brad Pitt just goes off and just blasts Kevin Spacey in the head, and essentially, Six times. yeah, essentially he, uh, he's uh, Morgan Freeman's right that John Doe completed his legacy. He completed the seven deadly sins murders, and Brad Pitt will have to live on in wrath. Uh, Brad Pitt is then arrested and sent away, and that's kind of where we end the movie. Um, yeah, well, except for that 
voiceover. Yeah, the Morgan Freeman's voiceover. What what is it about something about people in the city? Uh, I don't remember the exact quote. It doesn't matter. Uh so yeah, that's the ending. I don't I know I don't love the voiceover at the end. I don't either. I don't know why. It's it's always been kind of it's always just not set well with me. I don't know why. I got to say as popular of a movie as this is and as popular as this ending is in particular, it is directed and edited so oddly to me. It's so yeah. weird. Uh, this, the score is really weird. Brad Pitt's performance is so bizarre. Uh, the editing on some of the shots, like, I don't know why we have to see the hammer of the gun cock back when he pulls the trigger. It's just, not only that, the writing too. For example, when Kevin Spacey's describing to Brad Pitt that he went to his house earlier that day and met his wife, and he said, I took a souvenir, her pretty head. And I'm like, why the second part? Like, it's so much creepier if you just say, I took a souvenir, and then Morgan Freeman opens the box. Like, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm a s- smart viewer. I can connect those dots and figure out what he's yep. talking about. Um, just a little nitpicky stuff like that. But it's just, like, the, on a whole, did you notice this on the rewatch? Maybe it's just me. It's just, it just seems odd, everything. I don't know. I... Again, I think it's all intentional though, because it. I think it would be odd in any other film. Yeah, but for some reason, just like I don't know, everything in this movie works for me. Like all the weird little nuances and stuff. Like it just adds to the uncomfortableness of the film itself. But what? Which David Fincher is great at doing that kind of stuff. <laughs> but what? Like if he, if David Fincher wants you to feel a certain way when watching this movie, yeah. he will add little tiny things to make you feel the emotion he wants you to feel but what is going on with brad pitt's performance (laughs) it's so bad man Ah. like the close-up shots of him like crying and about to pull the trigger and turning away and he's like oh god oh god like you would not think that his wife had just been decapitated and his unborn child murdered like it's it's so weird it's such a weird performance and then of course the what's in the box what's in the box like it is a meme at this point because of how ridiculous it is. Like, I'm going to give you that one. He's, it's a little weird. He probably repeats it at least six or seven times, man. Like, Maybe seven. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, it's just not, it's not good on this. Like, like I said, I think the nostalgia factor was, was overcut this time by the quality. And I just, it's okay. such a drop, especially from the rest of the movie. The rest of the movie seems really tightly put together like for example if you juxtapose this scene with the scene where uh brad pitt has the gun to his head uh out in the rain that is one of the best scenes in the movie oh god when john doe has him at gunpoint and there's that that beautiful shot from the gun looking up at john doe it's like if you juxtapose these two scenes it's so bizarre maybe it's just because it's out in the daylight and everything else is in the rain but I don't know. It's su- yeah, it was super like, noticeable. I don't know, the whole ending, the whole ending, like once, literally once John Doe appears in the movie, mm-hmm. like fully, it it has a whole different look to it. I don't know, aesthetic yeah. and look. Yeah, for sure. Because um, everything before that's so rainy and dreary and dark, then all of a sudden we're thrown, thrust even, out of the city into a desert in broad daylight. Yeah. And it just, I don't know, it just kind of changes the whole film really um honest i'm not gonna lie the end of this movie is my least favorite part of yeah it. yeah exactly uh the, after brad pitt shoots uh john doing the head it cuts to the helicopter's perspective where john c mcginley's at and he just shouts over the radio oh shit he shot him somebody call somebody and i'm like what the fuck does that mean somebody call somebody that's not a line i don't know it really stuck I out mean, to me <laughs> it's uh, i think it's one of the I, i'm gonna defend that line somehow i'm gonna make this up as i go it's like one of the situations where you see something happen you're like somebody called uh um by i don't know something who handles this kind of thing like a cop just killed a criminal in custody who i don't know who we call yeah. the situation yeah, yeah. <laughs> i think that was the intention yeah the delivery delivery does not sell that no idea. not at all um 
There's two things I want to talk about with this ending uh, before we move on. Uh, listening to the commentary, I noticed that one of the reasons this location is what it is, is you'll notice there's a shit ton of power lines going through the scene. Um, and David Fincher said, story. one of the reasons he chose this location is because as John Doe, the character, he knew they would be bringing, be bringing a police escort and they would have to communicate through walkie talkies. And the idea was with all these power lines, it would be causing interference, uh, especially in the helicopter. Mm. And, they found out while shooting that that is actually true and that he had a hard time uh, instructing the helicopter what to do because he couldn't communicate with it very well because of all the interference from the power lines. Really? So that's there. There's that. So <laughs> um, <laughs> I also want to ask, did you know about the alternate ending of this movie? Uh, the one where Somerset. Kills? Yeah. So I actually yeah. didn't know about this until this past viewing and doing my research. Oh, really? Yeah, it was storyboarded, but I don't think it was ever shot, was it? No, they yeah. never shot it because everyone was so gung-ho about this ending being the ending. See, I like the alternate ending way better. I think it's it's it fits for a better story. Uh, so the alternate ending is kind of the same up until uh, the reveal uh, that John Doe has murdered Brad Pitt's wife. Uh and he's he's enticing him, he's luring him into killing him, saying, you know, become wrath, let your vengeance take over. Uh, Somerset's there screaming at Mills, if you do this, he'll win. You have, you know, you have to fight it. And right as Brad Pitt's about to shoot Kevin Spacey, Morgan Freeman jumps in and shoots him instead. And John Doe is bewildered, he's confused, he's irritated because he doesn't win this way. Um. And so, yeah, the ending pretty much plays out the opposite of what we get, uh, which I kind of like better because it makes for, I, I don't know, it, for me, it makes for a better ending. I don't, I don't, they're both fine. I mean, I, I just, don't know. I, I prefer I, the alternate. Because cause if we're looking at this. I don't know if it's necessarily better. Well, who do you, who do you see as a protagonist? to see it. Who do you see as a protagonist of this movie? I mean, we start and finish with Somerset. I would say it's Somerset's movie too, but it, I mean, I I could see a strong argument being made for Mills, where if this is Mills's movie, this ending makes sense for him. If it's Brad Pitt's ending, I mean, Brad Pitt's movie, this the alternate ending makes sense. I mean, uh, Morgan Freeman. Sorry. Uh, what, hang on, you just. I, I, me. I'm sorry. Let me rephrase that. If <laughs> if the ending we got is appropriate, if it's Brad Pitt's story. Okay. If it's Morgan Freeman's story, I think the alternate ending makes much more sense. Ah. Because he comes full full arc and in the alternate ending, going from a retired cop that just wants to be left alone for these last few days before he retires to uh, un, uh you know, admittedly just fucking murdering a suspect in cold blood. <laughs> and therefore never well, getting to just retire you quietly. Got, you got me all fucked up now. I don't know. Um, God damn it! Yeah, that's uh, Man, I don't know. That's uh, seven. That's a tough call. Yeah, that's seven. Uh, I feel like if you if you've seen this movie, you've probably done just as much in depth look at this movie from research and reading than anyone else has because this is a very popular movie. Um, like I said, to me, just as as a quick mini review, I just don't think it holds up as much as people think it does. I think the quieter scenes are the more enjoyable parts. I think this story has probably been done better. Um, for example, season one of True Detective, much better to me. Mm. Um, no, yeah, I, but they had eight hours to tell their story. That's I think the it's the character. It's because it's character driven more than plot driven. Whereas this movie is more plot driven to me. True. Um, um, I will say on this rewatch, this movie was a lot funnier than I remembered. It's got some good moments in there. Like I laughed multiple times, and I was like, "What the fuck is wrong with yeah. me?" <laughs> uh, I guess I was like really confused. This is a, a question we should ask. Uh, who do you think is gets the worst of uh, the victim deaths? Oh man, I think it's between two for me. What are they? I gotta say, it's probably between gluttony and sloth. Yeah, sloth would be brutal. Pride is not too terrible because it go you go out kind of quietly. 
Uh, greed. I mean, you're, it's kind of up and over. Uh, lust is pretty horrific. Yeah. Oh my God, that scene is. That whoever do who is that actor? Because that actor is fucking great. The uh the guy. Oh um God, what is his name? I um he, uh, he's in the Bone Collector. Oh wow. All right. Yeah. Oddly enough, I just watched the Bone Collector. And I was like, where is that guy from? Then watching this movie, I was like, oh my God, that's uh yeah, <laughs> the guy who does the thing in Seven. Yeah. Um. Le- uh, hang on, Leyland. Or sir. I like him. He's re- he's so good You've in this seen movie. It. You've seen him in a bunch of stuff. Yeah. Um, um Yeah, he's he's one of those guys like he's one of those guys where you're like, oh hey, that guy. I, like I, seven, um Independence Day, yeah. Escape. I would probably say sloth is the LA. worst. Yeah, yeah. Just because it's such a long process. I mean, gluttony is too, but I feel like with Gluttony, you, I don't know, man. Sloth just seems way worse, and especially because he's still alive at the end. Uh, God. Yeah, let us know which one you think is the worst on our subreddit. Um, I, <laughs> sorry, I'm just, I'm like still like racking my brain, like man, which would be the worst? But I think I do have to give it to Sloth. Yeah. Um, but again. If I was Leyland Orser's character, like, because if we're just going strictly deaths, mm. like, I think Sloth wins. But as far as traumatizing, I don't know, dude, like, that lust one's up there. Yeah. But then again, so is Sloth. Yeah. So um, it's between those two for me. So I guess I gotta ask, would you recommend, if people haven't seen this movie before, to see it? Or... If they're oh, absolutely. if they're no, uh, rewatching it, do you still recommend it? Um, I, I feel like it's weird to recommend a rewatch. Yeah, well, I guess my my <laughs> other my more forward question is: Do you think this movie holds up as well as it used to, as like when you initially saw it? Uh, I don't know. I mean, man. it's our childhood, um, I, so it's kind of uh, yeah, like kind of hard to say it's, no it's really i i back it still like dude it's fincher it's brad pitt it's morgan freeman yeah like i'm in i would say if you've never seen it give it a shot rewatch absolutely maybe, absolutely. maybe do what i do put the commentary on and just get some I, I i actually am i think after this i'm gonna <laughs> finally watch that commentary all right because i'm very curious i want to hear that mally silver linings do you want me to go first or do you Sil- want to go do you want to go first I'm gonna go pretty um surface level here. Okay. Um you know, John Doe got to complete his mission. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm siding with the bad guy. <laughs> okay. Um siding with the bad guy, because why not? It's not I'm a horrible person. No surprise here, mine might be a little controversial. Um oh, go fucking figure. Uh what else is new? I have to ask. Oh, ultimately, why, why does yours always involve a question? <laughs> All right, here I'll give you a simple one. Uh, Somerset gets to retire. <laughs> there you go. Do you think he retires at the end of the movie? Yeah, I would. Hundred percent. Yeah. But do you think he does? Yeah, I do. <laughs> I think. Okay. He wanted to from from the beginning, and after going through what he went through, he definitely wants to at the end. Um. My but no my my silver lining is ultimately who cares if John Doe quote unquote wins like who cares if he completed his plan and not from the viewpoint of oh we have to exact justice but if you take the physicality of it all by the end Mills and Somerset are for the most part fine I mean yes Mills loses his wife loses his unborn child uh, and there's like this implication that he's gonna go to jail for murdering an unarmed suspect in a case, but I would say given the evidence and the circumstances, he, he's going to be fine in court. I think any reasonable jury would, uh, dude, he cut off the man's wife's head and murdered his unborn child. Like I'm fairly confident. No judge is going to want to reside over that case. And if they do, they're going to be like, look, man, (laughs) 
Okay. <laughs> so my, my ultimate silver lining is it doesn't matter in the end. Like John Doe is just going to be one of several serial killers to have their legacy go on. And even so, it's it can easily be something that's buried. Like at that point, no one still knows his identity. No one really knows. The only people that have even seen his face are his victims and the people in the library when he walks in. Like it t- to avoid influencing future serial killers like they could easily bury this but yeah my silver lining is it doesn't even matter that all this happened like in the grand scheme of things he completed a seven deadly sins spree of murders who cares like life goes on mills is still alive somerset's still alive you know it's a heartbreaking ending i need i need a silver lining for your fucking silver lining jesus christ (laughs) my silver lining is dark my, my silver lining is nothing matters we're all gonna die (laughs) <laughs> um how about some pick me up movie alternatives to to brighten the mood no no you want to stay in this lull no, you have just <laughs> ruined me. well i've got um, a movie people definitely should watch after this uh god it's another police detective movie with a, a duo of of detectives that i think most people if they haven't seen already they'll definitely enjoy if they never have uh i'm going with the other guys i think it's a fun movie Wow, that's um Compl- funny that you say the other guys. Is that what yours was? No, my pick me up alternative, also a fun little buddy cop film. Mm-hmm. Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. There you go. So you can still get that detective kind of twisty allure that Seven might give you without the soul crushing ending. Uh yeah. Probably Mark Wahlberg's yeah, funniest so movie for pre- mine. Pretty much if you watch a David Fincher film, watch a Shane Black film right after. Yeah. <laughs> That's basically what we're saying here. All right. So that is 1995-7, directed by David Fincher. Uh, Mally, thank you for picking this one, as always. Uh, if you want to give us some feedback, you can over on our subreddit, reddit.com slash r slash silver linings playlist. There you'll find the official discussion thread for this week's episode where you can leave that contest code we gave you for a chance to win some free stuff. You can also just discuss the movie in general. You can give us a suggestion for a movie we should cover. You can leave us feedback, uh, whatever you want to do. Um, if you haven't already, please subscribe and leave us uh, a rating wherever you're at. We're on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, and YouTube. Pretty much anywhere you want to get podcasts, we're there. Uh, you can like us on Facebook, facebook.com slash the Silver Linings Playlist. On Instagram and Twitter, you'll find us as well. Uh, Twitter is uh, TSLP Podcast, and Instagram is just the Silver Linings Podcast, uh, the Silver Linings Playlist. We post things pretty regularly throughout the week, um, so give us a follow. Uh, Clue for next week. This one is this one's my choice, Melly, and I got I got a pretty straightforward clue that uh, anybody who's seen this movie or knows about this movie will pick up on. But okay, this is gonna be interesting. It's perfect for me. Uh, Clever next week. Life is peachy. Do with that. All right. Do with that what you will. We'll see you next week, Mally. Interesting. Uh, I'll talk to you later. As always, everyone. Excelsior. Excelsior.